we just let go by see how it goes. Right? That's great. <laughs> you can go now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go, please. Don't go <laughs> At least three of us have already heard it. Now. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm a delighted to so I will keep an eye on the camera. Oh, yeah. Oh, give me that. Thanks. I should cross the track. Yeah. Yeah. I must ask you much. Enough of Facebook. Give me this enough, isn't it? Email and Facebook are enough for me. It is, yeah. Uh, I did it right. Thanks. No I was not too easy. Grand, you're grand, you're grand. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.
Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for coming. This is going to be a nice informal evening. Uh, if you're looking around and wondering why there's some empty chairs, it's because there are three different sessions. People will be coming and going throughout because some of you might not be interested in cryptocurrencies, um, others might not be interested in bees. So we're expecting a bit of a flow of people throughout the evening. A little bit of housekeeping before I get into the details. Uh, the library normally closes at 8.30. If you hear an announcement at 8 o'clock and 8.15 telling you to get out of the library, please ignore. Uh, we're allowed to stay until 9 and the last person uh, has to be out by half 9. So we have a little bit of leeway. Uh, between 8.30 and 9 though, the doors will be closed. So if you're really bored at 8.45, you can't escape. <laughs> so sorry about that, but tough. Um, my name is Deirdre O'Shaughnessy. Uh, I'm from 96FM. We're very proudly partnering with Cork Discovers all day today. You'll see some of my colleagues outside doing the fun stuff with the music. Um, I'm the boring one, so I'm here doing the research. Uh, on the contrary, I'm really, really excited to be introducing some of these topics this evening. Uh, we're going to be hearing about birds, bees, cryptocurrencies, terrorism, the psychology of violent crime, and some other stuff in between. So it's a huge um, circular roundup, I think, of all life on this planet, human and otherwise. Um, so please stick with us for the evening. If you have questions, you will have loads of time to ask them. And if you do have them, please do ask. That's what we're here for. Uh, we're here to learn and we're here to discover. So after each panel, there will be a panel discussion. That's why the chairs are here. And your questions are absolutely welcome. We can get a mic to you if you think you need one. I don't think people will need one in here. Um, but if you do need one, you can wave and we'll get one to you. Um, we are going to be starting off this evening with sustainability, uh, something that I think everybody has started thinking about a lot more, particularly in recent months. Um, even those who have not been lifelong uh, green voters or revolutionaries um, have been really, I suppose, finding themselves thinking about this in the last couple of months partly due to the Fridays for Future group. Greta Thunberg, I think, probably should come up in some of the discussions later on. And, um, of course, the wider movement from the IPCC and some of the announcements they have made. We're going to be starting off this evening by talking about the birds. We're going to be talking about the, both the birds and the bees, but not in any kind of way that I could make a joke about. Um, so I won't even go there. With Tom Reed. He is going to be speaking about the extinction of birds due to climate change. Tom Reed is an evolutionary ecologist with an interest in how organisms respond and populations adapt to environments that are variable across space and time and heavily influenced by humans. He works mainly with fish and birds in Ireland and abroad and is part of a wider network of scientists studying fish ecology and evolution in dynamic ecosystems led by Dr. Phil McGinnity, Fisheye, which is a very clever name for that research institute. <laughs> Tom joins us to help us understand extinction rates of bird species and to let us know what researchers here at UCC are doing to help tackle it. Please welcome Tom Reid. Thanks, Deirdre. Okay, how's it going everyone? So my name is Tom and as you hear uh, there I am a zoologist, which means that I study animals. So, as Deirdre says, in particular, I'm interested in how animals adapt to changes in their environment. And uh, one of the most prevalent types of environmental change that animals and plants are facing at the moment is, of course, climate change that we're all hearing a lot about. Um, so, I'll just talk a little bit about how um, climate change is increasing the risk of extinction for many animals. And I'll focus, uh, in particular, on birds, just because I like birds, and also they're particularly well studied in this regard. Right, so, global warming as the name suggests, is very much a worldwide phenomenon. So nowhere on Earth is immune to the effects. But the impacts are playing out differently in different regions of the world. And ultimately, we really need to understand how these impacts play out at a local level, because that's the scale at which animals and plants actually interact with their environments. So just starting with the physical science there, you know, this graphic, the classic one shows, and the yellow there increases in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere basically since the Industrial Revolution. <coughs> so there's been this inexorable rise. And it's a well-established fact of physics that when CO2 and greenhouse gases increase in the atmosphere, you get this amplification of the greenhouse effect. And so global average temperatures rise. So that's the red there. So they've gone up by about just over a degree since pre-industrial times, which might not seem like an awful lot. But you have to remember, this is a global average. And also, um, the rates of warming, so the speed with which these temperatures are, are increasing, 
uh, is unprecedented for at least the last 10,000 years. And actually, some climate models are now predicting that um, under some scenarios, rates of future warming uh, could actually be more extreme than anything we've seen since the time the dinosaurs went extinct. So that's 65 million years ago. That's an extreme scenario, but scary all the, all the same. So, okay, so what? can either move, they can adapt, or they can die out. So I'll just kind of unpack each of these in turn. So we start with the movement there. Before I talk about animals, it's actually instructive to just think about this with plants, which are a little simpler in this respect. So you think, right, plants, they can't move. They're literally rooted to the spot. But of course, their seeds can be dispersed by wind or by animals. And so imagine a population of plants that live, say, in a, in a valley between the mountains. As that valley warms up and it gets drier, potentially with climate change, those plants might start to die out. But then they might start to slowly colonize via seed dispersal higher parts of the mountain range. So the whole range can sort of shift to higher altitudes. A similar process then plays out across latitudes. So again, imagine plants living in the Mediterranean parts of Europe, particular species. That starts to get really, really hot and dry. And so that plant species might gradually shift to more northerly parts of Europe, where the climate has essentially become more Mediterranean because of climate change. But the speed with which this happens, you know, you know it all relies on dispersal, in the case of plants. And so um, there are limits on how fast plants and indeed animals can adapt to climate change by moving. So if we think about animals then, they can obviously move. And indeed, many birds, for example, are migratory. So in the coming weeks and months, um, you know, lots of ducks and geese and waders are going to start arriving on our shores from more northerly climates. And um, there has been some uh, study recently that has shown basically that the numbers of these wintering water birds in Ireland have declined by about 40% since the mid-90s. It's big, big declines. So to put it in context, for example, the Buick swan, which is a small, dumpy, kind of um, goose-like swan. 95, there are about 29,000 of these Buick swans in Ireland during the winter months. That's now dwindled to about 200. So what's going on there? Well, the Buick swan actually breeds right up there in um, Arctic Russia. So that's where they you know, go to have their young. And historically, they would have then migrated from there down through northern Europe and into Ireland and the UK. But with climate change, what we're finding is that um, they're actually just not migrating as far because they don't have to because winters have become, mo become milder up here in, um, you know, in the Baltic regions or in Scandinavia. On top of that, then, climate change is hitting them on the breeding grounds as well, and so overall population numbers are potentially down as well. So while we're losing some of our birds, we're also gaining others. So for example, you've probably seen this character around Cork Harbour, um, Little Egrets, recently recolonised Ireland, and the numbers are on the up. We, we don't know if it's exactly linked to climate change, but perhaps they're finding the Irish climate increasingly to their liking. Okay, so what about adaptation then? So i just talk here a little about um, biological adaptation to changes in seasonality. So in biological terms, springtime, for example, you know, is heralded by when the leaves come back in the trees and the birds return and start to sing and insect activity increases. And what we're finding with climate change is that these spring events, biological events, are getting earlier and earlier in the year. You might even notice it outside. And so I was involved recently in a big international collaborative study where we looked at these things in lots of different birds and other animals. And so here's an example of uh, the song sparrow. This is from a population study in Canada where we see that they, they lay their eggs earlier in the year when spring temperatures are warmer. And that's a common finding that we found across... Um, lots of different um, species that we looked at. So birds and a few mammals in there. So as things are getting warmer, the birds are getting earlier. And to some extent, that's a good thing. So the next thing we did was we looked at the consequences of these changes in timing for the reproductive success of these birds. So it's a little hard to show this with the real data. It gets a bit complicated, so it's a little cartoon here. So on this horizontal axis, we have the egg laid date. So some birds lay late in the season, others lay early. And then on the other axis, the, the vertical axis, it's how successful they were. So did they raise loads of chicks or did they raise a f just a few or potentially none? What we commonly find is that there's a strong negative relationship here. So the early bird not only catches the worm, but they are more successful at raising chicks. And this is a essentially a Darwinian process in action, selection for earlier breeding. Um, and to some extent, it's because food tends to be more plentiful earlier in the year. 
So with climate change, what we're finding is that uh, in many of these studies, these populations, there tends to be a pronounced seasonal peak in the abundance of food. So say insects. Insects peak in early summer, let's say. But the timing of that food peak has got earlier and earlier through time um, because insects are very sensitive to temperature. And so while the birds are getting earlier through time as well, so they're laying their eggs earlier in the season, for example, or their migration earlier, they're not keeping pace with their food supply in some situations. And so you get this increasing mismatch. Um, so the final bit of the study then is we just did a bit of fancy modeling where we said, well, what are the long-term consequences of this? And in a nutshell, the current degree of maladaptation, so this mismatch in timing, it, it, it may be enough to threaten the long-term persistence of many of these uh, populations. So we're not saying they're going to go extinct, but we're saying the chances of extinction are going to go up if this keeps happening. But what we can say for sure is um, if the rate of future warnings, the pace of change is really rapid, species are just going to run out of options. They're not going to be able to adapt fast enough, or they're not going to be able to track their preferred climates through space by moving. Um, and so we could see lots more extinction in the future because of climate change. And climate change is not the only you know, thing that these populations are trying to cope with. There's land use change, direct exploitation, invasive species. Uh, pollution, etc. And I don't have time to go through all the numbers there, but they're pretty grim. You know, we're eating into biodiversity. But this is bad for the animals and plants involved themselves, but it's also bad for humans because <coughs> ultimately we all rely, humans rely on biodiversity and nature for, for our food, for medicines, clean water, raw materials, flood control, you know, recreational, spirituality, etc. So these are what we call ecosystem goods and services. Um, so I didn't want to leave you on a really depressing note. Uh, so I thought I'd finish on a slightly more upbeat uh, quote here from, uh, I believe it's pronounced Greta Thunberg. Yes, they done. <laughs> I practiced that last night. Um, where she says uh, to the UK Parliament, the moment we decide to fulfill something, we can do anything. So in other words, where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, but she also goes on to say that we must act fast. So thanks very much, folks, for listening. Thanks for the organisers. stuff. Uh, that was really interesting. I have loads of questions about that for the panel discussion a bit later and I hope you do too. Um, I just want to know about pigeons and can we get rid of them but we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, I saw some invasive species and I figured they'd come in there. Um, next up, have any vegans in the room? One? Okay. Next up, we're talking about dairy-free diets. Uh, this has been one of the, I suppose, the more controversial aspects of the whole discussion around climate change. A lot of people very, very unwilling to change, and a lot of people very, very militant about people changing. And then loads of us left in between who are just a bit bemused. Um, some of you will have seen the posters about taking calves off their mothers and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's fair to say there's big dairy, but there does appear to be big vegan out there as well, um, which makes it more of a fair fight, maybe. Uh, Lawrence Chalou is a principal researcher officer in the Livestock Systems Research Department of the Animal and Grassland Research and Innovation Programme at Tiagask Moor Park. He's a research coordinator on a number of research stimulus funded projects involving areas from developing models of the milk processing sector to developing a national sustainability assurance scheme. He's currently an SFI funded investigator and deputy director of the SFI funded Vista Milk Cen Centre. He's supervising six PhD students registered at UCD, Massey University and WR based Moor Park and he's responsible for the generation of the economic values for the Irish Dairy Cow Selection Index. That's all very complicated. Hopefully your presentation isn't as complicated <laughs> as that. Um, but I think it is an area that people are very, very interested in in Ireland at the moment because we're hearing so much about dairy, the impact of dairy on the environment, and of course because so many of our livelihoods rely on dairy and the dairy sector. Uh, now it's time to find out, I suppose, is there a happy place that we can all meet in the middle? Lawrence Chalou, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much. To, uh, thanks to the organisers for inviting me and thanks for uh, that introduction. So basically what I just want to uh, touch on uh, for uh, 10 minutes rather than 20 minutes, there was a 20 minute presentation that's going down to 10 minutes pretty quickly. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about balance and talk about balance in the context of uh, when we talk about agriculture. You know, farmers, sometimes when you stand back you hear 
you know, you hear that, that farmers are bad and agriculture is bad. And what we need to do is rebalance it and get to a place where we can have both positive agriculture, positive for the environment, uh, positive from climate change uh, in the overall scheme of things. First slide is just a, a concept uh, in relation to feed efficiency. So when we talk about feed efficiency, we think, sometimes we think of, okay, for example, total protein into the diet versus total protein out. And that's probably not a good way of looking at things. Net protein efficiency is where we look at what we can eat as humans. So that's, that's what, what we're competing for. Uh, what we can eat as humans versus what the uh, human edible that comes out. And that's really a better way of evaluating uh, a ruminant production systems or any production system that involves animals. Because any production system that involves animals that has a net uh, efficiency of less than one, well, that means that we're putting in human edible protein into a diet of an animal and we're getting out less. We, sh we definitely need that to be a bigger number. And I suppose, uh, you know, I put this up because, and this is based on French work, uh, when we look at the vast majority of how milk is produced in the world, it's produced in systems that are where cows are kept confined, 90% of global milk production, animals are kept confined indoors, where they're fed a diet of highly concentrated feed. And when you look at that, and look at the efficiency of that, compared to an Irish grass-based system, the way we do things in terms of grass-based is, is pretty unique globally. And when you look at it, grass-based systems do come out more efficient. So in terms of total protein efficiency, they're not good. But total protein efficiency is probably not a hugely interesting topic because we can't eat grass. There's loads of grass growing out there, but we can't eat it. So it's not really that interesting. When we look at it in terms of the net protein efficiency, the, the protein that we can consume as humans, TMR or indoor systems, which is how 90% of the milk is produced in the world, basically give you a conversion factor of one. So for every one kilo of human edible protein going in, there's one coming out. Grass-based systems, on the, on the other hand, and this is French work, uh, give you something like 2.6. We've done the same exercise with Irish data, and we're showing that for every one kilo of human edible protein in a, in a diet of a dairy cow in Ireland, we get out four. So I suppose we can have the debate about veganism, we can have the debate about animal proteins and, and the need for animal proteins or not, but the definite discussion should be around if we have animal proteins in the diet, they should come from an efficient process. And that's the argument I would make strongly that, you know, we might want to reduce the consumption of animal proteins and maybe that's a good thing. But definitely where do those animal proteins come from, it's very important that they come from efficient systems. Just the second point is in terms of emissions. And this slide, detail not important. This slide basically shows the uh, EPA national inventories for Ireland. First point to say is that, again, if you were standing back, you'd say that, listen, sometimes, you know, in a vacuum, you'd say that emissions from Ireland have dramatically increased. Emissions from Ireland, in terms of total emissions, are less now than they were uh, in 2006-07. So in 2006-07, we peaked at somewhere of the order of 70 million tonnes per year. Today, we're down to somewhere around 60 million tonnes. That's fact. That's EPA data. So, and that's not a, an excuse to say that we don't have to do anything, but that's just facts in terms of emissions. In terms of agriculture, again, detail not important here. In, in 1990, agriculture contributed 37% of total emissions from Ireland into 2017, that's 33%. So in terms of a proportion of the total, it's declining. The other point is in relation to, and this again, detail not important in this slide, it's just a, a line graph of emissions from the different sectors in, in, in Ireland. And it basically shows that, um, you know, agriculture has, has, has gone up and gone down a little bit, um, but it's broadly static over the last, since 1990. If you look at the big climbers, you're looking at um, it, it, transport gone from 5 million tonnes up to 15 on its way down again. Um, but you can see here that you know, agriculture itself hasn't dramatically increased over that period of time. And over that period of time, so the question often is often asked, are farmers more efficient than they were in the past? So over this period of time, emissions really haven't changed from agriculture, haven't changed that dramatically and declined, if anything. And over that same period, Dairy has increased by 61%, beef has increased by 13% and pig production out by 58%. So output has increased from Irish agriculture while emissions have uh, been static or, or declining slightly. So that's, that's, that's an important one. And I suppose just um, the final slide in this space is just to, to talk about efficiency of how um, food is, is produced. And this is a study that was done in 2010. It's getting a little bit dated now, but it's, it's a study that was done by the FAO 
and it basically compares different countries in relation to the carbon footprint of the milk that they produce. So if you look at it, um, the carbon footprint of milk from Ireland comes out there at roughly one. So for every one litre of milk that we produce, there's a carbon footprint of roughly one kilo of CO2 equivalent. Countries like, just take Germany, uh, you're talking about 1.7. So for every litre of milk that's produced in Germany, the carbon footprint is 1.7. Uh, and you could see the variation out there. Again, I'm going back to the point that there will be dairy consumed in the world. And all I'm saying is that it probably should be consumed. If we are to reduce emissions globally, it should be consumed from countries that are uh, more efficient than others. The other point here is, and again, I'm not trying to be controversial by putting this up here, but this is a study that was done in 2010 where it compares the, um, I suppose, the nutrient density of a food relative to the greenhouse gases that it produces. And it's a, it's a Norwegian study, and it basically shows that relative to the nutrient density of what you get from your food, dairy milk is actually, across all these different, stud this different products that were evaluated at the time, obviously red wine is coming out there at quite, quite low, but um, you know, basically what it's shown here is that um, relative to the nutrient density that you get back, dairy is not bad. You know, we hear a lot of talk about you know, different drinks that can be got in terms that can replace dairy milk, they mightn't be as good for the environment when you compare them based on the macro and micronutrients that you're getting that you think. That's all the point there. And we need, I suppose, a fair comparison when we are looking at any of these products. I'm, not going, to, I'm going to be caught for time, so I'm not going to into this in detail, just to say that you know, in terms of where you compare different milk production systems, again, same story, uh, grass-based systems come out quite well in terms of of the comparison. Again, there is significant variability in emissions at farm level. This is a study we did a uh, number of years ago, four, three or four years ago, where we compared a number of farms in terms of their emissions intensity. And basically what it shows here is that there is big variation out there at farm level. The average emissions intensity in this study was 1.11 kilos of CO2 equivalent per litre of milk. And there was significant variation around it. You could look at that negatively and say, right, there's a lot of farmers performing inefficiently in terms of emissions. Or you could look at it positively and say, there's lots of scope to reduce emissions at farm level. And I think there is, and, and that's a positive we can take for it. Climate action plan is here. Um, there is a number of targets right across the economy and agriculture is no different. And agriculture has a set of targets that has to step up to, and I think will be able to step up to those, those requirements that's put in place. We won't go into the details. Some of these are going to be difficult to achieve. We've heard a lot of discussion around the electric cars. We've heard a lot of discussion about some of the other issues. But you know, I suppose from an agriculture point of view, there are targets there, and agriculture is hell-bent on hitting those targets. And I suppose just to, to put it in play, what are the mitigation things that farmers can do at farm level? And Chagas has completed a MAC curve, which is a, basically a marginal abatement cost curve, which looks at the economics and the greenhouse abatement potential of different strategies. And there's a, whole, there's a list of these up here that farmers can, can, can do. And I suppose Chagas' role now is to put these in play at, at farm level. So the advice that Chagas is giving to farmers is, is broadly built around these set of seven different things, whether it's improved genetic potential, uh, putting in more clover into the system, changing to a different type of fertilizer that's less harmful for the environment, reducing losses from slurry, so uh, using uh, new technologies, be improving energy efficiency, so for example, solar panels on, on, on different farms, incorporating forestry into the, um, the uh, and hedgerows on, on farm and using advisors to help them. So this is a whole program that Chagas is rolling out uh, across the um, agricultural industry. Just the last couple of slides. And I put these in because I think they're relatively important in terms of the future. Um, there is things being ha happening now. There is research going on now that might change the dynamic completely in terms of agriculture. So this is just one on additives. So the big 70% of the emissions from ruminant production is methane. So there is some work going on now in relation to additives. Um, some have shown strong potential, so Trinop is a product developed by DSM, shown a 30% reduction in methane. Mutra, another product that we're just, we're just started testing ourselves in Moor Park, shown a 30% reduction. Um, others, like seaweed, you'd have seen in the examiner last week an article about seaweed, which is actually showing up to 95% reduction in methane. So there is potential uh, that new technologies are going to come and dramatically change the landscape in terms of emissions from agriculture, and that's where we need to go. Obviously, to date, that hasn't happened. 
just, I suppose, there's two things has to happen. We have to get credit for it in terms of our inventory, so we have to have a way of capturing it. And finally, we need to, I support support farmers in, in, in investing in these technologies because that could, could um, help them reduce their emissions. Next one is in terms of sequestration. Grassland, huge debate out there in the scientific world about does grassland sequester carbon? Currently in our inventories, we assume that, that our, our soils are losing carbon. That mightn't be the case. And so there's a huge program of work needed in terms of, of what, what the actual story is. Just to give you one example, one study showed that our grassland um, farms are sequestering about 1.7 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per hectare. Multiply that up by 4.5 million hectares, get, gives you 7.7 .7 million tonnes. So a huge number in terms of, of, of what's potential. So that's potentially there as well. Next one is hedgerows. Look around. You drive anywhere in the country and there is lots of hedgerows. Again, not included in the inventories. Is there scope that some of this stuff gets captured in the inventories? Uh, and that's something, again, that needs to be done from a, from a research point of view. The final one is genetics. So again, massive progress being made in terms of genetics uh, at farm level. Our data shows us that the type of animals we have now from a genetic potential point of view are much more efficient than what was there in the past. Um, so I suppose we're now developing a new index that will allow us to rank bulls uh, for use in the dairy herd uh, based on their greenhouse gas potential. And uh, our idea is that we link that to our current economic index using a carbon price. So if we put a price, carbon price of 80 euros or 100 euros a ton, on that within our index, we can also build economics and carbon emissions into our index and select more aggressively, even though we know now that we're selecting for less emissions, that in the future we'll actually select for even more less emissions. So I suppose finally, agriculture will provide some of the solutions. Agriculture needs to be seen in a positive light to provide some of the solutions, not seen as the enemy. Nobody is setting out to cause damage, uh, but they must be seen and included in, in the solutions. Uh, emission intensity, so agriculture is constantly improving in efficiency. Further initiatives, initiatives are being deployed to farms. There's more stuff being done at farm level all the time. Um, there is a requirement for more solutions, and we need to be better able to capture those solutions, and we need to be able to include them in our inventories. Uh, and I suppose, finally, you know, a lot of debate, a lot of talk about beef in the last few weeks. You know, the average income on a beef farmer is 8,500 euros. So if we are going to encourage some of these farmers to do different things and maybe get a return for the, the things that they're doing, we need to develop mechanisms that they're incentivized to do it, whether that's voluntary carbon trading or something like that, that allows farmer to, I suppose, do different things on their farm and get credit for it. So that's it. Thank you. Very interesting, a lot of information to take in from that one, I think. But again, I think we'll all have some more questions for you um, after that. Particularly interested about being able to rank bulls by emissions. If that could be applied to humans, I think it would be a game changer. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that later. Uh, next, we're going to be talking about bees. This, I think, is going to be a really interesting topic. Loads and loads of people talking these days about keeping bees. But Archie Laffin doesn't call himself a beekeeper. He calls himself a bee minder which is a totally different way of looking at the whole thing. Um, a couple of us have already been asking questions, so I think we've got the whole presentation down already. Um, I know it's a topic that people are really fascinated by. Um, honey, he says, should be seen as a byproduct of a process that primarily promotes the health of the native Irish honeybee. And we can all engage in small steps like protecting the habitat, increasing forage, protecting the soil, and not spraying. Uh, the spray, I think, will come up in the Q&A probably as well a little bit later. Please welcome Archie Laffin. Okay, so before we start off, I'm no entomologist, I'm not a doctor or anything, no fancy names in front of me. I tell you, the only class I showed up for was PE, I'd say, and some of my friends can tell you that. I'm going to start off by telling you about the inner workings of a beehive and the diseases that cause and what happens when you don't treat them. I'm a beginner. I'd say I call myself an experienced beginner, but I'll never, I'll, I'll always call myself a beginner because anybody who tells you are an expert on bees, just don't listen to them. So what got me into beekeeping? Uh, it was none of, the, of these. What it was, it was this fellow here, Jeffrey Seifert. He did this documentary, and it's basically a documentary that uh, bashes Monsanto. But there's a scene in it where 
he uh, exposes bees to a, con high, a high concentrated version of a particular glyphosate, and uh, the bee about walks around for about 10 seconds and collapses over. Now, I know that's extreme, that a farmer's not going to go around with a, a syringe and spray bees or whatnot. But he got me thinking, I was like, oh, let's get bees. And big, I suppose it was a big mistake and a big uh, success, really, in my life. Because this image happened, he brought his sons around to a farmer who just sprayed his field full of corn, and the kids couldn't walk through it. They'd wear hazmat suits because the concentration of the uh, glyphosate was so uh, strong that he couldn't leave them in there to play, so they put on hazmat suits. So, I suppose, what is a bee? I, I, how many people here know what a honeybee is? Hands up. Confidently say what a honeybee is. Okay. Is this a honeybee? No. No, correct. It's common wasp. Just feel a little garbage. Everyone thinks like, oh, kill the bee. I was like, stop. That's a, it's, that, or they kill the wasp. I was like, it's not a wasp, that's a honeybee. I keep up telling people to stop killing them. Is this a bee? A honeybee? A couple of no's, a couple of yeses. It's no. That's a bumblebee. It looks like a honeybee. It's a common character bee. We have these everywhere, you see them. But they're buff, so you call them bumblebee. Then you got this fella. Taking a lovely pink picture of pink lupins. What's this fella? Anybody? Bombus for Corium. Why tell Bumblebee? Close. <laughs> John, I'll keep up fair. You can do this. <laughs> so, this guy, or this girl, sorry, should I say. This is the girl we're talking about. The native Irish honeybee. Apis mellifera mellifera. Worth noting that all honeybees you see out foraging are females. Do not the hard work, typical. So, how does this bee come around, okay? The queen, she's quite different. She lays the egg, okay? And you're going to see an egg being laid here in a second. She lays the egg. After six days it turns, after ten days it turns, after ten, and then the worker bee, the female, comes along. There's cleaners, there's guard bees, there's foragers. Her job at the moment is uh, she's a cleaner. So what she's doing is she's capping the bee and going on to the next one and cleaning that out and doing the process over and over. Then after 21 days, it emerges. So you just saw there a queen and you saw a worker. So how many bees are in a hive? There's three. You've got a drone, which is the maid. Does nothing. Mates once, eats all the honey, and then leaves. <laughs> and got, no word of life. Then you've got a worker, this is the one that we have to protect that keeps getting killed and goes out foraging, that's the female. Then you've got the queen. So how do they come about? So, this is me here planting, I think, phacelia, I can't remember. I planted some phacelia and this is the beehive in the back. I've got a mouse guard up in it there because uh, my entrance is too big and mice come up in winter because it's warm and go through the hive. And inside the hive, okay, you've got this box at the bottom. You see all these boxes going around. The box at the bottom is called a brew chamber. It's where the queen rears her young. And this white strip here you see in the middle, it's like a grate. It's called a queen excluder. It's where the queen can go up into the supers here, these half boxes, and lay eggs. Because when you're extracting honey, if you put honey and the bee queen goes in there, you're spinning the honey, and out comes uh, a pupae, and then it's inside your honey, and then you've got to dump the whole jar, because no one wants maggots in their um, mm. honey. So what's inside that hive? You've got wax frames. These are wax frames to help the bee to move on. What happens then is that the bee draws wax on these frames. You see here where you have the original foundation and then you have what the bees did. So how do they make that wax? So they go and forage it. They don't. They take a drop of honey, the honey goes in, and from the back they shake out wax and they brush it up to their front and they manually create honeycomb. And that's, it's like us doing mud or something or mala. That's what they do. They heat it up and they mold it into honeycomb. And you see here, they're called, they're, they're, this is what's called festooning. When they festoon, they want to know the difference, how far they can go. So they all hold hands in a daisy chain and they walk across and they go, this is the distance we have. So then they stop. So they'll probably stop here and they'll probably stop here to give them space to walk up and down here. And this is them drawing the wax after they've festooned. So they know this is how far we can go. So they're about that much up off the foundation. And inside there then you see different stuff. So what goes in the honeycomb? After a full frame is drawn, they go, okay, now we can deposit stuff. So they're starting to deposit pollen here. And I'll show you how to gather pollen in a second. The pollen is deposited and you can see kind of light ones here. That's nectar and honey, which they have an enzyme in the stomach. When they get the nectar in, there's an enzyme that reacts in their stomach and it comes out as honey. So here you have then what happens when the frame gets, it starts to get full. All these white cappings here is when the honey inside of the cell has gotten so high that the bee comes down and go, that's done now. And it puts wax again from its front and waxes it over. This is what happens when you don't have frames in your hive. Natural process. The bees have still placed to walk up and down but it's a disaster for you. But that's fine, if you're a naturalist like me, leave them off, that's grand, leave them do their thing. But if you don't have frames, you'll never have frames because you have to destroy the hive to put the frames back in. Here then is what else goes in the hive. So we saw pollen so far and we saw honey being capped. All this 
What do people think this is? And there's lots of it. Anybody? Babies. All the female worker bees go inside these cells. The, the capping's a bit different from the honey. You see it's kind of more shaded yellow. And what happens then is that this guy, this girl pops out. After 21 days from being laid, she pops out, she eats away. That's actually a drone. You know, see the eyes here on this guy, on this girl. Kind of like a cool sunglasses where this got big, big, beady eyes. So then you say, okay, but a drone is bigger. How, how can a drone fit in that cell? A drone can fit in that cell. So a worker comes along and the worker sees that, oh, that's a drone. So it has to build up around it. Because if it builds too flat, the drone's going to break out and the drone, about, about 10 days, will die because it gets too cold. And you see, okay, how big can a drone be? That is how big a drone is. Look at the worker in the middle. And then look at the each drone either side. They're towering. <coughs> sandwich and you can see other eggs being laid here, and I'll show you that in a second. So <coughs> if the queen is bigger again, what cell is she going? She goes in a queen cell. And this is huge. This doesn't, it actually doesn't even fit in the honeycomb. They have to go outside it. So, she, so she's in there for the same amount of time. I think it's 19 days. I'm not sure now. She's in there for 19 days. But she's fed a, a different uh, composite of food. She's fed more pollen. Uh, more, she's fed more food, really, in, in terms of royal jelly. And then the enzymes react in her, and she transforms into a different bee. And this is her here. You know, you'll always find the queen easy, because it's taught that they're bowing down to her as she passes. Wherever she walks, the bees will leave a trail. So I followed her all the way up from the bottom of the frame, and all the way up to the middle. And as she's walking through, they're all walking inside. So if you look long enough at the frame, you'll see all bees moving inside, and that's the queen walking through. And here, if we zoom in on this picture here, you'll see that she's just after laying eggs. The eggs that we saw earlier, as a beekeeper, or a bee minder, sorry, as a bee minder, this is what you should see. When she's all these eggs inside her, happy days. You can actually see her, she'll lay another one right here as it's coming out. Camera wasn't good enough though. So, great, you've all these bees, and as a beginner, you're like, oh, grand, I got loads of bees. It's not great because you panic, because what happens is, is that all these girls have to hatch, and then you've got this. So you're there, you're like, holy crap, I got, <laughs> I started off with about 200, 300, 400 bees. And now we've got about 20,000. And they're all down in the bottom here. So this was a good summer. This was three years ago. This was a good summer. And you see here, this bee here, he's actually festooning here. But I lifted him up as he was coming, so he went away from the rest of them. They're all drawing more wax here, so they want to know how far they could go. And he's grabbed onto this fella. So this is what it looks like looking down from it. So you have to manually go through. And this is the brood chamber. Remember the chamber we were talking about? This is where the queen lays her eggs. She can't go up. So here you see what it looks like from down. And then you see this is a, this is a full frame of of uh, bees now. And you're trying to find a queen in this. And as a beginner, lads, it's impossible. I have to get experienced beakers to come down three or four times to say, will you find my queen, please? Because I couldn't <laughs> find her. <coughs> and I was afraid in case I put it back in, the kill her, if you kill a queen, job's over, the hive's redundant. So, that's grand, that's, that's, that's the bees. What do they do when, when they come out? They forage. And here you see a bee, a worker, after coming back. And this is actually the first picture where the way through, so here's a pollen basket here. The weight it was so much, it crashed landed right in here and fell in and then crawled up here. And then <coughs> it, it's, it's actually like it came back from this apparently. It's just <laughs> destroyed in pollen. So, how do bees get a pollen? These are phacelia I planted because I wanted to get blue pollen. All the honey, we ha all the pollen we have in there is warm colors uh, red, brown, yellow. So, what happens is you see here the anthers of the plant, the pollen on top of it. What it does is it has mandibles up the front and it covers the mandibles, like, it covers the anthers like that and drags it up its body. Then all the tiny hairs and it goes back. And it packs it onto the hair on its back leg and keeps packing it onto the back of its legs until it gets too heavy to carry back home. So you see here, some of the anthers are bare and some are strong. And she's obviously after going to a strong one. This is empty and they're all after visiting. So she's hugged them all up and she got in. But, so this, this is my picture by the way. So my picture is not mine. This is uh, what happens when the, um, pollen is mixed, when you get a, see an egg over here. But what happens is that the difference in pollen, you, usually in Ireland we just have these colors, these three here, chestnut, um, ivy, or um, uh, dandelion. <coughs> this is a thing we take in Sicily. So now we go, okay, that's how they make pollen. How do they make nectar? They make nectar by going into the bottom of the petal where the nectar is secreted. But it's a process that the flower likes because it knocks pollen down. If it's a self-pollinating flower, it'll knock the pollen down and then that's how uh, plants pollinate. But if it's a cross-pollinated plant, they'll subconsciously take too much pollen and go to the next plant and then deposit the pollen there. And then that's how that plant creates, it. crab apples and apples and all that jazz. This is how a bee then would see a flower. It's not oxidase, I think. But bees are tetrachromatic. They um, see in UV. So essentially what we see, this is a flower. This is how bees see the flower. 
So when you see a bee uh, hovering around, you're like, oh, I must like all the flowers. I'd have no doubt that they have a much more better time than we are looking at flowers like this <laughs> than we are the way we look at them, you know. All the, all the anthers here stick out and all where the nectar is sticks out on the bottom. But that's the good side of beekeeping. There is a bad side of beekeeping. Oh, sorry, the honey. Yeah, of course. So the honey, this is what it looks like. You know, the supers we saw up top, not in the brood. Because the queen can't go up there, this is pure honey. And this is what the beekeepers love and all the lads and uh, who be going out selling the jars of honey. Fair play to them. But you see here, the bees are actually eating this at the moment, and they need this because when you feed them with sugar syrup, there's no nutrition in that. This is all the nutrition and nectar from the plants. Unfortunately, it comes at a cost to them. This is a bee from a friend on uh, Instagram. This is a bee, that, uh, one of his beehives, and it's died of exhaustion. So they literally will work themselves to death for the good of the colony. They don't care about uh, going back and, and drinking honey. They might never take a drink of honey in their life if they're a forager from day one. And what they'll do is they'll literally die. It's a very sad picture, but that's what you see across the place. And if his tongue is sticking out like that, there's no, you can't save it. It's no good to save it. This is the bad side of beekeeping. A mice that came in about 30, 40 years ago from the UK, Vro destructor, the Vro mice, is parasitic. It eats on the fats and the sugars of the bee. It was thought to feed on the blood, but recent, so recent research is the fats and the sugars, so the bee becomes weak. And what happens, it has this fellow here, the fawn wing virus. So this is what happens when you take a scratching of a capping off the top of the brood and you think there's a mite inside there and there it is feeding on the young at about, I'd say, 11, 12 days. It sits on like that. It's like having a soccer ball stuck to the whole time. If you look at the size of its eye and look at the size of it, it's bigger than its eye. It's huge. So this is what happens. The bee can't develop its wings. It can't fly and all it does is eat honey. So what happens is, is that the healthy bees come in and they find it and they chuck it out and it dies outside in the cold. And that's where you get colony collapse. It's colony collapse disorder, pretty prevalent in America because uh, of their method of beekeeping. It's unfit to serve in the hive, they get it out. Bees are very hygienic that way. This was a very sad picture, I you two weeks ago. Uh, it's the first beehive I've ever, ever lost. Uh, it got attacked by wasps. And if you see here, there's not one honeybee intact. The wasps have come in here and they've uh, taken off a head here, a thorax. Uh, they've taken them all off and they get pretty vicious. You see here, stomach, stomach, head, 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 stomach. So, and you got, it takes about three honeybees to kill one wasp, I've come to realize. Uh, so I just think that the wasps are more, vicious, or scavengers are a lot more vicious and they're not, a lot more, uh, the qu quick one, the queen wasp stops laying eggs, so there's less sugar coming out, so they have to go find sugar. That's why you see them around the jam jars and your bottles of coke and stuff around this time of year, not in the spring because the queen's giving them sugar and the larvae's giving them sugar. So, very sad, this is a queen here that was fighting, that wasn't came up and no head, it's gone. And these pictures are very sad because these are the saddest for me. These were uh, babies that I brought up from the other hive because I knew this hive was weak and they were doing well. But the wasps have come along and just opened them up to see if there's honey inside there. And then subsequently the cold got to them and it killed them. You see bees here looking for food at the last second. If you see bums in the air and the bees aren't moving, you've trouble. And this is a baby that just emerged. And from my thinking, I believe that a wasp would have just killed it because it was coming out. And I reckon the wasp would have just done it a couple of times because the difference between honeybees and wasps, when honeybees sting you, they die. When wasps sting you, they don't. Because the wasps have a non-barb sting. It's like a sewing needle, in and out, in and out, in and out. Whereas a honeybee has a barb sting. So when it goes in, it can't come out. And when it does come out, it comes out with their gut intact. So that's why you see the sting around you the whole time, and the venom sac. Very sad picture, me holding one of the girls. I was gutted. I remember it's 10 minutes, on my knees crying, two years of work, undone by a couple of wasps. So in conclusion, let it grow. I know everyone here is not going to be a bee minder or a bee keeper, and I appreciate that, but you can do small things. To, you can let it grow. Please leave dandelions where they are. I know you might like them, but just don't spray them. The, the bee saw a while ago covered in pollen had, uh, that was all dandelion pollen, and it's the first source, the first early source of pollen and nectar fermenting. Ivy. I love ivy. I don't know what people's problem is with ivy. It's lovely. It's the flowers, and it's the last source of nectar and pollen that bees have before winter. All the other trees die off, horse chestnut, all the other ones, they all die off. So ivy is the last abundant source of honey and nectar that bees can get. And not in pollen, before the winter. They're all harvesting it right now as we speak. I'll show you a video here. So this is horse chestnut, one tree, and this is the flower of a horse chestnut. Look at all that, like, the amount of honey that I get off horse chestnut is ridiculous. The amount of honey the bees get off horse chestnut is ridiculous. And that's the scale. So leave it grow. Don't cut down a horse chestnut. I know it's scary, but Jesus, leave it grow. It's, it's fine. This then is ivy, no one thinks ivy flowers. This is ivy just about to flower. 
You see here all these little pods up top. They're about to burst into these yellow anthers and a little bit of nectar down the middle. It's fantastic. And all of that goes to the bees. Cut it down after it's done then if you want because it'll just regrow. You know how vigorous I is. This is the bees a day after. This is a, couple of, this is a couple of days ago. You see all the pollen sacs on the back of their legs. Their stomachs are full of nectar from the ivy. Their, their uh, legs are full of pollen and they're all coming to the hive. This is in real time. They're working so vigorous to get it in before the winter comes. They're trying to get it in. I had to go shortly after this because this bee spotted the camera and I had no gear on. And he came, she came straight for me. And this, and this is a nice still frame as well of this bee about to go into the hive. It just shows how much weight they're carrying because it's almost pollen, but compared to a bee, ridiculous. But this girl here, she didn't like the camera and I had to run because I'm getting stinged too much these days. So leave it grow. These are briars. Briars are lovely. Jam. A bumblebee on them. Leave it grow. Get out of this uh, thing about mowing your lawn and keeping it pristine. Unless you're playing a match in Crow Park, <laughs> you don't need to mow your lawn. This, what happens is when you mow your lawn, uh, once in December, when it's the coldest day of the year, and once just before the start of spring, leave everything on the ground. Scatter that up front, all the seed heads go, the birds come along, they get the seed heads, and the bees benefit. A byproduct of helping the bees, you're helping everything else. And get back to conventional ways of doing the garden. I know everyone here is not going to get a scythe and all that jazz. But the workout you get from doing everything manually, and just to bend, the, the benefit mentally is unbelievable. And this is what happens. Seeds fall, they rejuvenate, and you've got hedgehogs and everything inside here. You've got some field mice that comes up. I know people don't like field mice, but they're actually scarce enough. And if they come in, you've got birds coming in. This is, a, I think, a black cap. Yeah, a, a female black cap. She was on the ground, the dogs were around her, and I put my finger, hand on to help her up, and she got up my finger. 40 minutes I must have been there just staring at her. It's the best time of my life. <laughs> it's a hedgehog that came into the garden, just because we left the grow there, a red adam butterfly. And just before I finish up, there's no Celtic proverb, if you ever think you know beekeeping, you never will know beekeeping. Because there's a saying, Sri ni sakura hushkid, intlip na man, over na mat, agus chakta agus imna patida. The three hardest things to understand, the work of the bees, the mind of women, and the coming and going of the tide. <laughs> and whenever you do a beekeeping, have fun. Okay? <laughs>
um, because it fixes nitrogen, reduces the amount of chemical nitrogen you need to purchase, increases grass growth, it actually increases the quality of the feed that you're giving the cow, and at the same time reduces methane, so it's doing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And you said that it also is big for the, for the bees. Yeah, white clover, good for honeybees, um, but red clover is bad for honeybees, their tongue isn't long enough. But bumblebees can get red clover, so any clover. Yeah. Clover, okay. Yeah. Can you buy clover? Like, oh, yeah. The ordinary person yeah. buy it? It'll probably come naturally yeah, if you don't touch it. Yeah. It'll probably come yeah. in the ground if yeah. you leave it, like, you know. Okay. Uh, now, does anybody else have a question? Because I have loads of questions. Hands up if you do, or just wave at me. Yeah, one back there. If you just stand up and, and shout, that should be okay. Um, Lawrence, just have a question. Do you think that we'll ever get to a place where, <coughs> you know, as global warming is a global problem, and that we'll actually, if, if the world needs milk, we'll produce it in the most efficient way, in the most efficient place. If we need solar, we'll do yeah. that where we should, yeah. similarly with wind. Yeah. Um, obviously national targets are important, yeah. but it is after all a, a global issue. Yeah. And, and for me, that's, that's exactly where we have to go, but current policy doesn't, doesn't basically do that. Co current policy counts carbon at a country level, and that's how we're, we're judged is at a country level, and which is, is a little bit, you know, might actually be incentive to do the wrong things at farm level, because, you know, focusing on our grass when we're not getting credit for it, you might you mightn't do what you should be doing because we're just not getting credit for it. If we look at how oil is treated, oil is not treated up, up from from the country it comes out of the ground. It's it's where we consume the oil is where where that gets counted. So I'd be very strong that we need a consumption based approach that counts emissions where, where they're consumed. And that gives the consumer a very strong choice in relation to what they do at farm level because that has a direct impact on, on emissions. Uh, that's something that may happen in time, but you know, from an inventory point of view, we're a long way away from, from, from that. You know, that's a really interesting question. Thanks. Um, very interesting point. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Um, uh, Archie spoke about, about the spraying and not spraying, and I've seen that well. But one of the questions that goes up is that when people have issues that they would normally use spray for, what are the alternatives? Hair work, elbow grease, <laughs> mulching, you name it. My field at the moment you saw there is covered in dock. Uh, I was advised by uh, a friend of mine, he, he said, I'll come along tomorrow and we'll spray it. And I said, stop. So because of the way a dock works, it's vigorous. It's like nettles. It uh, goes underground and roots mm -hmm. and comes up. And it's then when it seeds. So the term is one year, one year seeding of weeds is equal seven years of weeding. So if you leave them, but I don't care no more. Like I'll go along and I'll pick it up and I'm not aesthetically worried about the garden no more. Like, I think I Japanese knotweed as well. I'm just going to keep pulling it up, keep pulling it up, pulling it up. If anything is good for the mind, going out in that garden, <laughs> pulling up roots and stuff, there's a bad day at work, you go and pull it up and stuff. But it's not that I'm, like, sprays have their uses, but just not for me. And I know people do use them, they, they're very good in non-windy days, they're concentrated fine on a certain weed, and it'll kill it. But, I mean, I've seen birds eating dock seeds and everything, you know. I mean, so everything has a balance. Just people don't like it, and they don't like it. That's great. So hard work, a lot of cardboard. If you got cardboard, mulch the hell out of it, and uh, elbow grease. That's all. That's the solution you were hoping for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, in relation to um, invasive species, I suppose the Japanese knotweed is probably <coughs> the most famous invasive species we have at the moment. Yeah. I remember, we did a segment on that on the show about five years ago, and which absolutely wild. Watch out for the foundations yeah. of your house if you have it. Um, but we all learned from that. Um, birds and invasive species and uh, pigeons and seagulls where I live seem to be just everywhere and looking around for the smaller birds of course they're what everyone wants to see anyway but in terms of biodiversity and um, are, are they a danger to other birds smaller birds or do they just kind of elbow them out of the way the pigeons the common city pigeons is yeah, it yeah. well the gulls are you know native to Ireland as well so yeah. they, they've replaced although their numbers are probably higher maybe than they would have some, in some cases than they might have naturally been because they're getting augmented with all this food supply from humans. Yeah. Uh, but the pigeons in terms of posing, I mean, yeah, I suppose if their numbers are high, they could potentially spread disease to other species as well. But um, and they originally come from the rock dove, which is a native species as well in okay. this part of the world. So yeah, they're just a domesticated form of the rock dove. So. And are they benefiting the same way as the gulls from kind of human rubbish and stuff like that? Is that why their numbers seem to have gone up so much? Or have they? Is that just a perception? Uh, I'm not sure about the sort of global trends in pigeon numbers, but uh, certainly they're, I don't think they're any pro in any problem anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, they're very much 
adapted to human altered environments, so they, they thrive in our cities and um, they probably get a bit of bad rep, you know. My uh, yeah, sister in law calls them rats with wings, but um, <laughs> <laughs> they, don't, they don't do me any harm, and I don't think they do, and they don't do any harm to the other birds. No, no, oh, okay. no. They're in fact we they 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 supply food for you know peregrine falcons in our season, so you know they they're a source of prey maybe for other predators oh, as well. So okay, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, because I thought the rats with wings things was was kind of where I was coming from as well. So okay, that's good. <laughs> I'll leave them alone. So not that I was doing anything, so I don't have telecom really. Um, nobody else has a hobby of shouting at pigeons. No, uh, lady here in the front has a question. Yeah, I'm interested in the part that you talked about where the birds are not keeping up with the insects. And are some of the birds also having a difficulty with um, training their young to move on and to fly, uh, maybe on a, on a second litter, litter probably the wrong word, but second set, where they're not keeping up, and do they leave some of them behind because their the seasons are changing? Yeah, it's a good question. So many birds are capable of second broods, as they call them, with birds, so they can have you know two sets of young, two clutches of eggs in a year. But actually, climate change is potentially extending the growing season you know for many species so they might be able to fit in a second brood you know there's some evidence that some species are having you know uh, more second broods now okay. because of climate change but as to whether it impacts uh, your, your first bit was about whether it impacts I, 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 their ability to teach them. some of them yeah they, they have to take their young to move on to kind of move south or whatever and they have to leave some leave some of them behind because they haven't learned to fly fast enough is that happening? Uh, yeah, I've heard some reports of that as well, but um, it's potentially another factor in okay. the whole thing. But uh, yeah, maybe if their season is cut short for some reason, then they might have to abandon, okay. you know, maybe not quite give as much care as they would have to the first brood, yeah. and that might impact the second brood. But it's a kind of a bonus for them at that point. Okay. Mostly, yeah. Okay. Mostly they rely on their first broods for kind of leaving offspring into future generations. A really interesting question. I'm going to take one more question from the audience for this panel and then we'll move on just because I'm conscious of the time. Who's it going to be? Nobody? Question? Yep. Uh, interested in uh, Lawrence's presentation about the distribution of the different farms and uh, I'm an economist so I'm interested in, in the productivity problem in Ireland which says that the very small businesses are actually really really lagging behind in their productivity compared to the, the big players. And I'm just wondering, is there any type of similar story in the farming? Very interestingly, when we did the same, so we did the economics part of that paper as well, and we linked the economics to greenhouse gases, and essentially the farmers that were more greenhouse gas efficient were more economically efficient. So selecting for efficiency in terms of grass, type of cow, all that had a very had a, had a strong influence, which is good in the sense that you know we tell farmers to be, do things to be more profitable and. The byproduct was they were more efficient from a greenhouse gas point of view. Were they the bigger ones? Yeah, there is there is some data showing that there are scale effects, but okay. you know it's not that massively pronounced. Okay. So okay. yes, there are scale, and you'll always have early adopters, um, but it's not you know scale has an effect, but it's it's relatively small in the farming in, in you know in the in the yeah. dairy industry. That's a good story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can I just follow that up with a yep. question? So if you're selecting for reduced emissions from cows, is there a trade-off where you're getting less production, less meat production, so or uh, yeah, it's a good question. Question. in other respects? So, so essentially, uh, if we have, um, when we select, let's just say a genetic selection, we're selecting for animals that are more efficient in the sense that they produce more milk from grass, because that's our cheapest feed, uh, with a lower replacement rate. So all those things are positive from a greenhouse gas point of view as well. So that's it's why a win -win. it's a win-win scenario. The same with uh, growing more grass. When we more, grow more grass or using clover, uh, we're reducing costs out of the system, which at the same time is reducing emissions from the system. So you have, you have the double whammy. The slight problem is that we don't count emissions intensively. Yeah. We count total emissions. Yeah. And that's, that's the problem that our industry has at the moment. It has become much more efficient. It is one of the most efficient in the world, but we don't look at that. We're looking at total emissions. When you say it's one of the most efficient, where are we the most efficient? Uh, say it again now. Where would be the most efficient? So in New Zealand. So New Zealand is the only other industry that's grass-based as well. It's yeah. solely grass-based, and um, their their environment means that they don't have to <coughs> house animals at all, or very little. Um, basically, means that they're a, a bit more efficient, but not not hugely compared to when you compare it to other systems. Okay. That's interesting. Yes. Uh, okay. I think that's it for this one. Folks, thank you. Oh, sorry, we have one more question. Yeah, go on. Go ahead.
mention about feed additives towards reducing methane emissions. But um, if you mentioned like seaweed having a different, would that change any of like the milk yield in terms of composition or anything like that? Yeah, obviously a key part a key part of any of these studies that we're doing is to look at the impact on you know taste characteristics, residue characteristics, and some of these um, products are having an effect on the end product, and it's something that we need to obviously make sure that there's no deleterious effect. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, we're looking at that as part of our overall size. And um, actually, I had a follow up question on that one as well in relation to the seaweed. Then, where is the seaweed source? So it's actually can we? It's Spargostus is the is the is the actual uh, seaweed type, and it is grown in Ireland. But you know, if we presume that um, this is something that we can prove that it works on a consistent basis, well then that's another industry that yeah. I think uh, you know there is a little bit of concern maybe that it would destroy the ecosystem. Obviously, at that point, you take it out of the the, the marine area and maybe grow it in, in, in other areas that you'd have to, you know, and that would be a whole maybe industry that would build up around it, but yeah. you can't sacrifice the uh, maritime ecosystem to reduce greenhouse gases, so that would obviously have to be part of the overall yeah, package. Yeah, obviously Bantry was what yeah, I was yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Okay, very interesting. And thanks a million, guys. I think that was really fascinating. Can we have a round of applause for it? just arriving um, and thanks to the three guys for that really really fascinating presentations and um, a lot to think about there